Welcome everyone to this third uh, digital workshop from Robotics for EU on uh, Robotics for Agile Production. Uh, so the, today we will discuss the topic of uh, regulating AI and what is the impact of the European Union AI Act on Robotics for Agile Production. Um, I am Silvia uh, from NTNU, uh, Norwegian University of Science and Technology, and I will be uh, the chair for today. So first, let me just go quickly through the agenda. Um, so we will have a brief introduction on uh, what is the Robotics for EU uh, project, so who are we today organizing this event, um, and then we will hear from two very, very interesting uh, keynote speakers, so first from uh, Vera Lucia da Pozo on uh, AI-based robots under the Artificial Intelligence Act, and uh, then from Professor Martin Ebers uh, on the AI Act and uh, uh, a truly risk-based approach for robotics. Uh, we will have uh, uh, time, a little bit of time after each keynote for you to ask questions. Uh, and then after that, we will have another presentation from one of the Robotics for EU partners on the uh, Responsive for Robotics Compass, which is the main outcome of our project. Um, and then a discussion in breakout rooms. So, First, we have presentation about what is the robotics for EU. Um, Lucas, are you in the meeting? Yes, I am here. Yes, would you like me to continue to share my screen, or would you like to share your screen? Uh, no, you can. Uh, you can. You can. Uh, you can do it. If that's okay. Okay. Then I give the word to Lucas from Civita. Hi everyone! Thank you so much for joining uh, today's workshop. I'll do a brief introduction. Uh, for, for Robotics for You, the project that we're all involved in. Um, Sylvia, if you could put the next slide. Um, yeah, so the aim of our project is to ensure more widespread adoption uh, of robotics in Europe. Uh, more concretely, we are focused on non-technological barriers. So the first thing that if you hear that word, you think, what, what are these? Um, this is everything to do without the actual technicalities of the robot. So it could be uh, socioeconomic factors. It can also be legal factors, of course, what we will be discussing uh, today. Uh, but it can also be factors related to data security and uh, and things like that. Um, if you can go to the next one. Uh, yeah, we're doing so in uh, four different uh, main like fields of robotics. So we're doing that in healthcare, uh, inspection, maintenance, agri-food, and also in agile production. Uh, both inspection and maintenance robotics and agile production robotics, we have a, a really cool event coming up uh, uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, the 3rd and the 4th of October in Delft. Uh, that's in Netherlands. So if you feel like you learn, uh, want to know more about uh, these non-technological barriers in those two specific fields, this would be an amazing opportunity for you to, uh, to go there. Uh, and we will reimburse uh, travel costs and accommodation costs up to 450. Um, so maybe the next slide. Yeah, so we have done a lot of uh, uh, amazing things over the course of our project. Um, we've done like a societal needs analysis with a lot of responses that is on our um, uh, on our main website. Uh, we've done citizen consultations. Uh, we also have a virtual exhibition where we uh, in VR created a kind of muse museum layout with, with robots from those fields. Uh, this is a really, really nice kind of marketing tool for, for robotics developers if they're interested in it. Uh, this is completely free to participate. Uh, the only thing we need is your, your uh, 3D model. Um, and right now we're currently working on uh, the policy recommendations for, for Europe. Uh, like I said as well earlier, the co-creation workshops and agile production and inspection and maintenance that are coming up. Uh, and we're developing a, a tool. Uh, it's an online uh, uh, online tool that I'm sure that we're going to hear more about today briefly uh, as well. Uh, with this tool, robotic developers can, uh, can create their own overview of how far and how well they're doing along these, uh, these non-tech barriers, and they can track their, their progress over time. Uh, 
Uh, and of course, we're helping with the AI on demand platform integration. So that's a lot of information I know, uh, but just if you see uh, and like what we do here today, um, then please don't be afraid to reach out. I'm sure that uh, we're going to have a lot more uh, touch points with each other, a lot more things that we have in common uh, where we can uh, can help each other out. And uh, yeah, and we're really open for, for this collaboration. So if you have anything that later on you hear from us, then, then please uh, don't be afraid. Uh, we are very open to that. So that's from my side. <laughs> Thank you, Lucas. That was a very efficient presentation, but also, as you said, we will hear more about the Responsible Robotics Compass later. So if that's especially interesting, we will hear about it more. Um, so just briefly uh, to introduce why we decided uh, to talk about the AI Act today and uh, what is today's topic, uh, but just a little bit, because then we have the keynote speaker, we will talk a lot more about it. Um, so why we decided to talk about the AI Act is because there has been uh, recent uh, amendments adopted on June 14th of this year. Um, so this brings a lot of uh, new uh, changes, very recent changes to the regulation of artificial intelligence uh, based robots. Um, and in this AI new amendments to the AI Act, there is especially a new emphasis on users' protection, users' rights, um, so also human oversight of the robots and environmental sustainability. Uh, so we wanted to have this event uh, focused on the effects of this um, uh, regulation on the robotics for agile production, because uh, we asked ourselves, like, what does this mean for AI-based robots? Um, in the context of agile production, so will it bring new challenges to the adoption of robotics, or will actually will it actually mean that we will have better opportunities to introduce robots in a more um, uh, responsible and socially responsible way? So. First, before starting with the keynote speakers, we have a very short poll uh, that we would like you to uh, fill in. Um, so ooh, if you can launch the poll, so you will see a section in the, in the Zoom uh, menu where there is the chat, the participants, uh, Q&A, there is also polls. Uh, and if you click on that, you should see some questions. They are just uh, three questions that we want to ask you about what is your, um, first impression, let's say, and reaction to the effect of uh, the Artificial Intelligence Act on robotics for agile production. So I'll give you a couple of minutes for answering. Very interesting to see that many of you have actually a positive general feeling about the AI Act. Like a consistent majority. <laughs> see, 23 responses. Some response is missing. I will give you 30 more seconds. I think we can close the poll. I don't see any more answers coming in. Yeah. 
So yeah, the first question is just about your uh, specific profile. So you are also not from registration. Most of you are, are from academia. Um, but yeah, then it's interesting to see, as I said, you have positive feelings about the Artificial Intelligence Act for robotics in agile production. Um, so that's good. And we will, of course, explore what are the different ramifications today. And um, we also saw from the, from the registration as well and from this uh, quick poll now, um, that the main reason for people joining this event today was to be updated about the Artificial Intelligence Act. So I think that uh, we can dive right into that um, and go to our keynote speakers. Yeah, sorry, I was just checking to share the poll. So the first uh, keynote speaker today is uh, Professor Bela Lucia Raposo. Um, she's Professor of Law and Technology at the Nova School of Law in Lisbon. And um, Veda, the floor is yours. Let me stop sharing. Well, uh, thank you so much, Sylvia. Uh, hello, everyone. So um, here I am, back to Norway, right? <laughs> Not digitally. So okay, I think you can all see my my screen now. Well, uh, for this for this presentation, as I think it's very obviously from the title, I was inspired in, in the movie I Robot. I, I have to say, uh, I was not even aware there was a book. I have not read it. I saw the movie many years ago. And, and the movie is about a kind of dystopian society where, well, robots, or at least some of them, were a little bit the bad guys, right? And I think this is uh, the outcome, the scenario that we want to avoid with all the many risks involved in AI and in AI-based robots. And so during this presentation, I will focus mainly in the so-called AI Act, which is the draft regulation on AI being currently uh, under preparation in the EU. So uh, to start with the idea that actually we don't know exactly how the AI Act will turn out to be, okay? Because this is still being prepared. And uh, as it is common in this kind of legislative process within the EU, we uh, have by now three versions of the AI Act and actually the final one might not be exactly as any of them. So, um, we have first the, the first version that was released by the European Commission in 2021. And then there was one that was approved by the Council in November uh, 2022. Um, then we have the European Parliament that we just mentioned very recently in June 2023. And now all these um, institutions are in the so-called trial, meaning that they are trying to reach a consensus on what will be the final, the final outcome. No one really knows knows when it will be approved. Well, uh, I've heard uh, that will be in 2024, eventually the first half, but I mean, nowadays it's just a prediction. So it's very difficult to talk about the AI Act because it still does not exist as such. Basically, all possibilities are on the table. But there is one note that is very present in all the, the three versions. So it will be very present in the final one. I think there is no doubts about that, which is the risk assessment model. This is very common in new regulations. So basically, we uh, categorize the object of regulation according to the level of risk. And from then, we depart to provide different legal frameworks. So in the case of the AI Act, we are talking about risk to health, safety, and fundamental rights. And so we have what we call an acceptable risk AI, which is banned, even though th there might be some exceptions. We have high risk AI, uh, which is allowed, but under very restrict conditions. And then we have low risk AI, which actually can be subdivided in limited risk and minimal risk for which very few is required. So just a few highlights so you can have a clearer idea. Uh, so unacceptable risk is in Article 5. Here you have have what we could find as an acceptable risk AI in the first two versions. We are talking about manipulation, um, manipulation associated with micro-targeting. There is manipulation which is directed to specific vulnerable populations, such as children, the elderly, pe people with uh, some kind of mental discapacity, social scoring. I think the best example I can give you is a Chinese model. Uh, biometric uh, identification uh, when used by law enforcement. And then the last version, the one of the parliament, added a couple of more. So you have here biometric categorization. So once again, we are using biometric data, emotional analysis in some scenarios, um, risk assessment for criminal proposals, what we call predictive AI, uh, the collection of images from CCTV cameras or from the internet, 
we still don't know how will be the final version of this norm. Robots uh, are very unlikely to fall into here, at least under the current version. I'm going to jump immediately to the low risk because I want to focus more in the high risk. So in the low risk, uh, as I told you, for, for the minimal risk, basically nothing is required. The AI Act encourages the, the developers to create a code of conduct, not mandatory. In the end of the day, no one will check if the code is actually complied with. And then you have transparency obligations for the so-called limited risks, such as well, this, this kind of chatbots, deepfakes, etc. But let's let's go to the high risk because uh, AI-based robots will fall, most of them at least, into this category. So um, this uh, you can find in Article 6. And note that Article 6 is actually a very long and complex norm. So I'm trying to... Uh, to, to summarize it. Long story short, it will be high-risk AI, uh, AI systems that are themselves an independent product or are part of another product and uh, who, are, who are regulated by um, what we call an harmonized legal framework, which is uh, imposed by the EU so that all EU member countries can have kind of uh, the same legal framework. And those harmonized uh, regulations and directives can be found in Annex 2. So this is what you can find here in number one, or the ones uh, that are listed in Annex 3 and that are considered as being AI systems that pose a significant risk to uh, health, safety, or fundamental rights. So this is the general understanding. Now, where do we have the robots, right? Well, um, robots fall into the category of, of machines. And um, well, I know, I know that probably our, our friend uh, C3PO might not agree, but, but well, it is a machine, right? So they will be regulated by this. This is also a new regulation. It was recently approved, the machinery regulation. It will enter into force only in January 2027, but it, it's already, we already have the final text. It's fully approved. This is just a grace period so that people operating in the field can adjust. And it's very important to um, framework robots uh, or at least most, most of them in this machinery regulation. Because here's the point, and actually let me go a little bit before. This machinery regulation is one of those regulations that uh, was created by the EU for harmonization proposes. So it's also listed in Annex 2 uh, of the AI Act, meaning that this will be a high risk uh, AI system and therefore we fall all the very dense and strict regime which is provided by the AI Act for high-risk AI systems. And what kind of legal framework are we talking? Well, as I was referring, it's um, AI, uh, high-risk AI systems are, are, um, uh, are subject to a very strict legal framework. And I think we can divide the kind of the level of demand into two temporal moments. There is some requirements that apply. There are some requirements that apply in a, a pre-marketing moment before the AI system reaches the market and other set of requirements that apply after that moment. So before the system reaches the market and actually as a precondition, so the system can be approved into the market, uh, the high risk AI system must obtain that. This is the C marking of conformity. You know it very well. You can find it in many products that circulate in the EU. And uh, this shows a high respect for safety, health, and environmental protection. Well, in, in order to have the CE marking of conformity, um, the, the AI system is um, will be will be subject to the so-called conformity assessment, where we will have to check if it complies with several and very demanding requirements. So, for instance, uh, we have uh, requirements regarding the data sets that are used to train and test the AI models. You have requirements of transparency, basically the disclose of information about the AI system. And, and I think it's very curious because the AI Act uses the expression transparency, but actually it's a very uh, wide scope of transparency involving also explainability. So the AI Act does, does not distinguish both concepts. Then you have human supervision. This is called the, the uh, basically the, the shutdown switch. It's always necessary to have a human under control and the possibility for the human to stop the system in case of severe malfunction. 
accuracy, robustness, cybersecurity, and um, uh, last but not least, traceability and auditability, meaning that the AI developers must keep documents of everything that is made regarding the compliance with these requirements, frequent logging of events, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. As you can see, it's not easy, right? It's not easy to comply with all of that. And moreover, with some of these requirements, there, there are some issues or there has been some issues. I mean, uh, different versions of the AI Act have different solutions. So, for instance, regarding data, uh, the original version of, of the Commission in its Article 10, Number 3, said that these data sets should be relevant, representative, and now look, error-free and complete. Well, um, I know, I, I believe that you more than more than me that work in practical terms with, with these kinds of data sets know that this is like a unicorn, right? A data set that is has no errors and is complete is a unicorn. So the other version, starting with the council, but also the parliament, uh, kept um, a version of this norm with a very important amendment. So the article 10, number three says, and to the best extent possible, free of errors and complete, which obviously is a much more accurate and realistic demand. Uh, let's see again how it will be under the final version. Then also some important issues with the conformity assessment. Uh, that assessment so you can get the C marking of conformity. So uh, under the AI Act, many AI systems will undergo a self-assessment, meaning there will be the AI developers themselves to self-assess if they are complying with the AI Act. <clears throat> Again, this is not new. This kind of self-assessment, it's very common in EU law. Uh, you can find in some medical devices, for instance. In a way, you can find it in the GDPR because most of the times are the data controllers that assess if they are compliant with the applicable norms. So it's, it's very common. It seems to work well. Otherwise, the EU will not insist in the self-assessment. But, but there are exceptions. Uh, for instance, AI systems that should undergo a third party conformity assessment will have to continue to have the third party conformity assessment. And one of those systems obviously are the ones submitted to the machinery regulation, even because the new machinery regulation that the one I just mentioned, just the one just approved now this year, and that substituted the, the machinery directive actually extends the, the situations in which there is a third party conformity assessment. And uh, according to Annex 2, uh, um, well, in Annex 2, the kinds of, of machines that are that, that meet the requirements of Annex 2 are the ones that should undergo a third party conformity assessment. So if the AI based robot falls in Annex 2, and I look, I'm not that familiar with the many types of robots that you can have, so I will assume that not all of them, I don't know, but the ones that go into, into Annex 2, they are submitted to a third party conformity assessment under the machinery regulation, and therefore the same applies under, under the AI Act. Now, how is this third party conformity assessment then? Well, here, another layer of complexity. Um, most uh, oftentimes it is done by the so-called notify bodies. Notify bodies are very common to do this kind of assessments in all the EU. And it, they are imposed by the machinery regulation to a third party conformity assessment. They are imposed by the AI Act. So first question, are we talking about one single general assessment that is valid for both? Or, or do we keep it as two different assessments? I think at this point it's still not very clear to me, how it will work. And actually, I have the same problem with, for instance, the assessment for medical devices. So it's not only under the machine regulation, because this kind of overlap of the assessments might take place between the AI Act and other regulations that are already in place. And uh, for instance, assuming that we have two different conformity assessments, which is an assumption, because quite frankly, I don't know how it will develop. Is it to be done by one single notify body or, or by two different notify bodies? Uh, Article 38 of the AI Act talks about the coordination of notify bodies. So, but, 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 but actually the norm is very vague. I got the impression that it is not mandatory to have one single um, notify body doing the assessment or the assessments. You can have more, but they should coordinate amongst themselves. But then again, yeah, I, this is one reading of mine. It's not necessarily what the norm says because the norm is very vague. 
Uh, and the other thing is that we don't know, we don't have that much information about these notified bodies. They already have been called a privatized compliance industry because frequently they are private companies to whom we pay to be assessed by them. Uh, so the very idea of leave them the the assessment of compliance with, with the private entity that is paid to do that also has raised some issues. And again, Article 37 of the AI Act. It is titled Challenge to the Competence of Notified Bodies. And the main idea is that we need to assess if the notified bodies, which have been qualified to do so, they have been accredited to do so, if they are using their competence as well. Otherwise, uh, they will not, they, they will lose the competence, so to say remains to be seen how strict this assessment is going to be performed. But as I told you, this is just the first stage. This is what happens before the AI system, in our case, our AI-based robot, which is qualified as a high-risk AI system, reaches the market. It's not the end of the story. Because when the AI, the high-risk AI system is in the market, we still keep an eye on it. And actually, uh, there is an analogy that has been made between this phase and something that happens with pharmaceutical products, with drugs, um, that is called pharmacovigilance. I don't know how familiar you, you are with it, but for instance, in the case of a drug, um, once it is approved by the drug authority in charge and has the marketing authorization and is fully being used by patients and, and, and used in medical practice, uh, patients, uh, doctors, health authorities have the obligation to report any negative event. So it's pretty much the same idea that it happens here with high-risk AI systems. And so much so that we also call it algorithm of vigilance, it's kind of doing an analogy with pharmacovigilance. So the idea is that the providers of these high-risk AI systems, the importers, the distributors, even the users uh, can um, and eventually have to report uh, malfunction, severe malfunctions of high risk AI systems, which uh, ultimately can lead to the to the removal of the AI system, and and because it's considered uh, as being of excessive risk. Now, I think uh, I'm coming to the end. I'm not. I don't know how we are with time, but I'm about to finish. Just highlight some issues uh, that probably. Well, I, I hope I like many, but some of the ones that concern me is that, you know, when we have these fights for territory, like uh, one regulation says, this is my territory, and the other says, this is mine, and we have the very same situation being ruled by many regulations. I think this might happen here, because there are potentially so many regulations that might apply to AI-based robots. So we have the AI Act, right? We have the machinery regulation. Uh, we have the GDPR because it obviously involves data. Eventually, if it's qualified as a medical device, uh, we can have the medical device regulation and, well, and so many others that now don't come to my mind. So I think there might be some overlaps between these norms and, well, I'm not very sure, but eventually even some conflicts because all these regulations are so detailed that it's very difficult not to have some conflicts. And not only between norms, but, are, but also between bodies and authorities. Because each of these regulations has like a board, uh, um, a boss of the boss is a supreme chief, whatever you want to call it. And of course, they all want to keep their territory. And for instance, one thing that I already envisage, and it's not because I'm predicting, it's because they already mentioned, is conflicts between data protection authorities and these new AI authorities. Uh, the European Data Protection Board has, be, has been very active in assessing AI systems. Um, this is uh, an authority established in the GDPR about data. So will, they, will the board be able to share this competence and these powers with the new board for AI? Uh, and also between um, more national authorities, for instance, the French data authority, CNIL, already made it very public that they still feel entitled to continue to assess AI systems. So you can imagine the fight that we'll, we are going to have. Just some words about innovation. I think, um, of course, when you talk about AI-based robots, which because it's it's kind of a disruptive technology, innovation is very important. The AI Act does have some norms about it. The most interesting are the ones about regulatory sandbox. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with it. Basically, it's a 
it, it, you see the, the kind of sandbox where kids play. It's the same idea for developers in new domains of the industry. It's a more flexible legal framework when they can experiment, launch new products, and to see how flexible are the applicable norms. And this is a win-win situation, obviously, for the AI developers, right? Because they can test new products, but also for regulators and supervising authorities because they can spot the weakest points in the regulations. Uh, the good news is that the, in the first version of the commission, the norms on sandbox were very, were very few. Basically, we didn't know very well what was coming, and now it's much more detailed. I do have a concern, which is not only mine, is the issue of liability for participants in the sandbox, because um, Article 44, number three, and I'm referring now to the, I think this is the version of the parliament, says that participants remain liable, participants in the sandbox remain liable for the, and the, the applicable norms for the kind of harm caused by AI systems while they are in the sandbox. Well, the question is that liability with AI, the applicable norms, as Article 44 says, it, well, they are very demanding. We are talking about strict liability presumptions of the fact, presumptions of causation, presumptions of culpability. So I'm wondering how encouraging will be uh, um, the participation in, in, in this sandbox if the participants know that even though the legal regime is more flexible, they still have to face exactly the same threshold in what regards liability for harm caused by the AI systems. So to finish, if like an overview, I will say that it's good, it's good, it's a good effort, but not too much. I think there are still some issues we need to consider. Um, considering my, my talk here, I will say that there are many requirements. It's very detailed, it's, it's very complex. Uh, and, and the problem is, or the problem for you that try to create new things is that it is not very encouraging for innovation, meaning that people here, innovators here in the EU will have a hard time and eventually will have some um, some brains going to other parts of the world where innovation, it will be easier. Unless, of course, the Brussels effect apply. Brussels effect that we had with the GPR means that the rest of the world emulate our very good laws considered the standard of the art. So if other jurisdictions find that our AI Act is the standard and they emulate our regulations, well, it will be the same in every place, even though I'm not very confident in this scenario. So I'll leave you with some of my references on this issue. Uh, please contact me if you cannot have access to some of them. They are not all uh, open access. And like very last words, I, I know that my speech has not been tremendously uh, encouraging and positive. Yes, I know it's not very reassuring, but it is that it is, right? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Vera. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't uh, maybe in the beginning, I wouldn't say it was not encouraging, you just were realistic also about the limitations and the flaws of the of the act right now. Uh, but it was surely very informative and very interesting. So we have only a couple of minutes for questions, but if anybody has some questions for Vera quickly, um, you can raise your hand and unmute yourself or type it in the chat. Uh, Hi, thank you very much. I was about to type the question, but uh, I'm happy to uh, talk through it. It was an amazing presentation of the AI Act, very uh, comprehensive, uh, very well distilled, and I totally agree with the, with the criticisms, with the complexity. And I just wonder, it's more of a general what-if kind of question. Um, some some of the early commentators I was following and when I was trying to write comments on it as well, that, that was the criticism I kind of received myself was, what if instead of having the AI Act, we would have like AI additives, like AI additions to existing legislation in different domains. So for example, an AI add-on with when it comes to robotics or medical robotics or medicine, healthcare, um, uh, transport, climate, uh, so, so more domain specific uh, types of AI, because AI is not a single thing. And that's one of the key problems in the AI Act, like the definition is so vague uh, that nearly anything under different conditions can, ta can count as uh, overly risky or less risky, manipulative. Sometimes manipulations come from different, uh, from, from, 
areas that we don't really expect. So I would like to, to hear your thoughts on that. Well, Vasily, uh, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, difficult question, right? Uh, it's difficult because, I don't know, I, I think it's it's certainly a possibility, though I, I don't know. And when I say I don't know, I'm not defying the solution. I, I frankly <laughs> don't know if it will solve the issue of having these regulations being very detailed and, and the overlaps. Because even if we add some parts on the different existing regulations on AI, we will still have AI systems that pertain to the object of several regulations. So for instance, what comes to my mind, in the, actually the example I gave, you can have an a, a AI based robot, which is a machine and therefore machinery regulation, but it's also a, a medical device and therefore medical device regulation. And of course, all the data regulation. So it is certainly a possibility. I don't know if it will solve the issues that right now are concerning under the AI Act. Eventually, I would say that the UK approach seems more flexible, well, they usually are, right? Even in, in, in terms of the GDPR, more interesting, even though, of course, it's still under development, so we don't know how it will turn out to be. But since it, it, it recognizes that it's difficult to create a comprehensive regulation that regulates in, in detail all the intricacies of AI. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you again, Vera. And uh, because time is crunched, I think that uh, we don't have more time for questions. As I said, I just, uh, because I want to briefly give the word to our partner, Anne, uh, and talk about the Responsible Robotics Compass. Um, so as I said, we, I think it was great to have this connection to Azure production because what we are trying with Robotics for EU is exactly to take all of this concerns, in including concerns about uh, law and regulation, and give a tool uh, to robotics developer to uh, be able to assess uh, what is the status and the responsible um, the responsibility level of their robot. So, Anne, the floor is yours to present RoboCompass. Uh, would you like me to share the slides, or do you have slides of your own? Oh. I, can, I can share my own. Okay. Uh, we're having some trouble hearing you. Um, I think it's because your microphone is here. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, now, now is it okay? Yeah, that's no, perfect. Okay. Yes. Oh, I I can't share. Uh, okay. Can you uh, allow me yeah. to share? Yes. Wu Cheng, can you make your corpus? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, now yeah. You should okay. Be able. No, no, I did. No, I can't. Okay. I just spent some time to find you. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Uh, so, uh, thank you a lot to the previous speakers for the very interesting presentations. I only have five minutes and uh, will try to be very short. Uh, the Responsible Robotics Compass is one of the developments of the Robotics for You project. It is going to be a tool uh, for robotic manufacturers to try to judge uh, whether the robots would be accepted by society and try to help them to um, advance this acceptance, to improve their acceptance. So to develop this tool, we had uh, a lot of different input data. Uh, there were interviews of robotics researchers and industrials. We had a population of the general a survey of the general population to uh, judge what are the issues that are most important to the Europeans today. A survey of policymakers: what policies could be put in place to advanced robotics acceptance, uh, several high-level workshops. We did one-on-one -on -one in-depth interviews on uh, specifically requirements that we could put into robotics, uh, into the Responsible Robotics Compass. We also tested it at ERF. We had collected opinions of ethical experts that follow our projects. And right now we are doing one-on-one -on -one testing with robot manufacturers, and we are also going to uh, collect uh, feedback at the co-creation workshops that Lucas told you about. So the idea is to consider the acceptance of robotics uh, in the society. And for that, we have 
uh, selected, we have considered all the issues that can hinder the acceptance of robots, and we categorized it into five uh, areas. So environment, socioeconomics, legal data, and human experience. Uh, for each of those areas, we are subcategorizing it. So for example, in the environment, there are issues that can arise during the production of the robot. For example, the use of chemicals for the preparation of a surface before painting, stuff like this. Uh, for the logistics, there are the transport of the robot to the, to the uh, company, uh, to the client. Uh, um, during the lifetime of the, of the robot, for example, in the operation, the robot can uh, can operate outside and destroy local fauna flora, either accidentally or on purpose. It can also ha uh, have some impact on pollution uh, and uh, also the use of resources. So for example, a robot that is going to uh, be using water or uh, fossil fuels that resources that uh, need to be monitored and that can impact the acceptance locally of this robot in the society. So we have these five areas. How do we evaluate the robot on this? So we created a self-assessment uh, grid. That is, let me display all the bars, yes. Uh, so we created a self-assessment tool that is uh, similar to filling a grid for each of these five areas. We are, uh, we're looking at the risks that are applicable for this robot. So, uh, for example, uh, let's say data risks. What data the robot is collecting? Is it collecting sensible data about sensitive data about the humans that are operating it? Is it uh, operating in an outside uh, in a public environment and also collecting data about people who are uh, who have nothing to do about uh, with this robot? And then once we have uh, completed all of these uh, checklists uh, for one category. We also look at the mitigation steps. So what, how these uh, risks can be mitigated, how it can, how the robot manufacturer can improve the acceptance knowing that these risks are applicable. So for example, uh, for the data, the data can be stored for only as only stored locally or only stored for a given duration of time. So in that in that way, uh, by communicating on these uh, mitigation steps, the robot manufacturer can improve the acceptance of the robot for the users and for the people around them. Uh, so the tool presents itself like this. There is a uh, on the right here, you have the five categories. These are dummy scores, but we have the the, right, the five cat categories, and we can also look at the detailed score for each subcategory, at how um, which exactly which parts are exactly affecting the score. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah? Okay, uh, and so we also compute a global score as a weighted sum of all of the other scores. And so you have a global estimation of how good you are doing on this. The idea is to have a tool uh, that you can sell, do your self-assessment at any time and you can repeat the assessment and see during the development of the robot when you take new, maybe uh, add new functions, add new options or communications to the user and see how you can improve or deteriorate the acceptance and also to provide some uh, recommendations to improve your, your acceptance rate in the future. Uh, so regarding the timeline, the tool is already available uh, on the RoboCompass website. We are currently uh, doing rather limited testing. We do test with robot manufacturers. We're also testing at the co-creation workshops. But uh, at the beginning of October, a new updated version of the website will be live. And then there will be a public release and you can, we'll communicate it about it to everybody. So I think that is all for me. If you have any questions, Please feel free. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Anne. I was just putting the link to the RoboCompass in the chat awesome. uh, if anybody wants to go and try. Um, otherwise, we now have our breakout room discussion where we can also talk. Sorry, I have to scroll down the slides. Yeah, we, we can also talk uh, more about the RoboCompass. 
Um, mm -hmm. So we will have three breakout rooms and you can decide which one you would like to join. Um, let me, okay. Uh, so there will be one on regulatory readiness. So on the robotic, robots regulatory readiness about governance of the data and accountability. So you should be able now to see the rooms and decide which one you would like to join. And we will discuss more about the specific uh, subsections of the RoboCompass um, and the legal part of it. And uh, can you confirm to me that uh, you can join the breakout rooms? Yes, but uh, there's you have to scroll at at the bottom of the of the page. What do you mean? Oh, so you have to, there's the list of all participants. Of, yes. Oh no, sorry, you, that's you because you made me. Uh, you can choose one which one to join. But I, I'm, I'm going to be facilitator. I think. Yeah, you, you should still choose yourself. Uh, you oh, be okay. facilitating it's... regulatory readiness. So I'm let's go sorry. for accountability. Okay, <laughs> all right. Okay. Osnot, which one are you joining? I cannot see where to join. I'm trying to join accountability. Oh, you need okay. to break out rooms. And then you will be able to... I guess the people need to click in the section below, right? What section? I can't see breakout rooms section. Uh, so there is this option here on the button that you can press more. There's three dots next to the leave button. And from there, you can. Hello, Ninke. Can you hear us? Yes. Hello. Yeah. Uh, would you like to share the slides? Um, I am not the facilitator of this room. I'm just here to take notes today. Ah. Oh. All right. <laughs> so probably, um, let me see. Uh, just one second. Okay. Um, regulatory move to regulatory S. Yes. Uh, Anna is supposed to be the facilitator. What, yes. what, what, what? I just move, move, moved you to this room. You you should be the facilitator for this session. For the okay, I was uh, I was told I was to. Uh, okay, sorry, I I didn't realize. Uh, so, is there anyone for uh, uh, for accountability? Because I thought uh, to... for the accountability is should be Usner. So so we can start. Okay, okay, so we're good. Share. All right, sorry no problem. Sorry, sorry for the. Yeah, I was following the the instructions in on the document. All right. Okay, so should I share the slides then? Yeah. That's good. Okay. Uh, so. 
the the idea of uh, this breakout room is to discuss the risks and mitigation steps that we have um, identified for the regulatory readiness in the robo robot responsible robotics compass. So uh, we are trying to be as exhaustive, precise, and synthetic as possible. So it's uh, <laughs> kind of uh, d difficult to not forget anything. So uh, the idea is to see whether we have missed any risks, whether we have missed any ways to mitigate these risks, and whether the formulations that we have identified are uh, clear. So that's uh, the risks and mitigations that we have for the regulatory readiness. Uh, for us, it's part of the legal uh, category, and uh, we are. It's not easy for this topic to identify uh, the risks. Honestly, we have went the way we have said uh, that the more advanced uh, in uh, the the more high TRL level a robot is the most important it is the that they comply to all applicable regulations <laughs>